I have a message that I, I'm really excited about today for a few reasons, because I'm going to be talking to you about the gift of healing, but I'm also going to be talking quite a bit about sort of the elephant in the room when we talk about these kinds of things of God healing and we pray for healing. And it's almost like if, if, if you, we don't get the answer we're hoping for, then it's like we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to uh, address it. No, you just need to keep going. You just need to keep asking and keep asking. And I'm not saying you don't. We're going to talk about all of that, okay? But really felt strongly about this for today. So um, the statement that I would like to make from the start is that if you're at a place where you're waiting for God to heal you, but he has not, there is so much living for you to do while you wait, okay? And you can experience and get to know God in ways that you would never enjoy if you were perfectly well. And we'll talk about that, okay? That's a tough issue. This is kind of a tough issue today, and I really have been prayerfully going over it. And, and, uh, and I'm going to tell you that much of today's message is going to take a little spiritual maturity on your part. And if, you, if you're a newer Christian, newer believer, that's great. That's fantastic. We're so glad that you are where you are and learning. And we can learn so much from you. I know that. We can learn so much from people that are new Christians because they can remind us of things maybe we've forgotten. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. So, but if you are a new Christian... Just test what is taught. I'm going to give you just that little instruction. Test what is taught. No matter who teaches it, never take every, everything just for a oh, while. Wow, uh, that's gospel. Match, you know, line it up. Match it up with the word of God. Okay? Just make sure that what's being taught is from the word. So if you're a new Christian, and if you're not, that's always a good thing to remember. So first of all, I want to say that I believe the church should pray for healing today. I do. And I don't believe this because of my own experiences or because my denomination tells me so. Okay? Um, I believe in supernatural healing because the New Testament teaches that the Spirit gives this gift And other gifts to the church and instructs me to desire to exercise that gift. That's what the New Testament teaches. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 8 and 9. To one person the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one spirit gives the gift of healing. Now, I believe that God answers prayers for healing when it accords with his sovereign will. Now, that's not a cop out. OK, and some people would say that that is. It's not a cop out at all. It's what the word of God says. Going to look at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. This says, So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation? Talking about salvation through Jesus Christ, that was first announced by the Lord Jesus Himself and then delivered to us by those who heard Him speak. And God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. What does this say? Whenever he chose, he gives these gifts whenever he chose. It's God's choice when the gifts are given, what they are, and how they'll be used. It's his choice. It's not mine, because I am not supernatural. He is supernatural through me and through you. He's the one that's supernatural. Okay? And when we accept Christ into our lives, he comes to live within us. Yes, yes, yes. But he's the one 
who does the work. And he's the one who does things that are supernatural. Are you with me so far? Okay. All right. He chooses when the Spirit will supernaturally work through us. Now, as I've gotten older, I've consistently tried to prayerfully look at Scripture for what it says. Not just what I've heard by preachers or books that I've read. I've read a lot of them. I mean, and there's so much good teaching that I have heard, so many good books that I have read, and some of them are absolutely valuable, okay? But what does God say in his word? Taking into account the culture at the time, the circumstances at the time, the context of that scripture, and the original meaning of the words themselves. And what if I find, based on my own experience and evaluation over time, that some things I have been taught just aren't so? I, there, have, there have been things that I have been taught, and the people who taught them, I thought, well, okay, this is good. Uh, this is good. I, uh, I trust them, and, and I think it was well-meaning. But as I have gotten older and gotten to know the Word of God better, Okay, some things have not played out what has been taught to me. So what do I do? I go to the Word. I go to the Word of God, not on how I feel or how, or how I wish things were. Okay, not on how things didn't turn out in the way I had hoped. So when God gives a gift of healing, it's always intended to glorify Jesus Christ and to point us to believe in his gospel. None of us has authority to heal a body. Only God does. That's why we always pray in Jesus' name. And when God heals someone, yes, he does it for the individual because he loves them. But he does it for the common good of the church and as a witness to the world. You may not think of it that way. Well, let's look at Scripture. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. This is talking of the spiritual gifts. For the common good. This is what these gifts are for. Earlier we read that God confirmed the message of salvation by signs and wonders and miracles. Healings are not merely going to be individual blessings. They're not... They're not just for the individual. They're that the message of Christ can be confirmed. And it's not just when it's preached from a pulpit, okay? It's, it's in, in a church. It's in different surroundings where, where you might be talking about Jesus. Uh, and so it, it confirms that message, and it's for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When someone is divinely healed, God has purposes beyond just the individual. Now, about this time, you might be thinking, well, that sounds kind of cold-hearted. Just hold on. We're going to be okay. Because you might think, well, doesn't God care about me? Doesn't he care about my situation? Doesn't he care that... I have a disease. Doesn't he care that I have cancer? Doesn't he care that my back is so bad that I, I could hardly stand? Uh, I've got some other kind of disease. Doesn't he care about that? Well, yes, he does. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. 1 Peter 5, 7, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. God is near. God cares about you. But listen, he also has the big picture, and we don't. We just don't have it. And this is the example that I like to use. If you're, let, let's pretend there's a parade, and you happen to be behind a fence, and all is through this hole in the fence. And all you see is the horses that go by. And then you might see somebody throwing candy or a clown. Or you might see a, a Boy Scout troop riding by or walking by. But all you see is one at a time. Okay? Because that's, 
that's what we have in this life is kind of what's, what's right there oftentimes. We can't see the future, okay? Now, God is different. It's, it's as if we were in a low-flying plane over this parade, and we could see the beginning and the end. That's God's perspective. He can see it all. He sees the future. He knows all of the past, and he knows right now. So he knows what's best, and we don't, okay? But does he care about you? Absolutely. More than you will ever ever know. So then you might ask, well, what about faith? Does that have anything to do with healing? Yeah, it does. Absolutely. Faith does have something to do with healing. The Bible teaches us that healing, like other spiritual gifts, can be inhibited or hindered by our lack of faith. Let's take a look at a scripture. It's talking about Jesus. Matthew 9, 28 through 30. It says, when he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. So we find that God wants us to believe in him, and that he's the one from whom the healing comes. And I want to say this, that a lack of faith is not some kind of club which we're going to beat afflicted people with, okay? If we find that our faith is small, the best thing to do is begin to ask. Begin to ask. We can ask for more faith and begin to pray for healings. Um, I like this in Mark chapter 9. This was a, a father whose son was demon-possessed, and he said something to Jesus like, uh, well, if, if you can do something, uh, you know, please help him. And Jesus' reply is, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. That's a good prayer. Help my unbelief. We believe in God, and we believe that God is a rewarder, the Bible says in Hebrews, of those that diligently seek him. All right, I want to talk about faith just a little bit. The reason that God desires faith is that faith glorifies God. Faith points us away from ourselves and points us to him. Faith turns us away from our own power and our own resources to his. Faith says, Lord, I am nothing, and you are everything. I entrust myself to your care. I cling to you alone. My confidence is in your word and character, no matter what happens. Now, I have been taught at certain healing services. Uh, you just don't see this as often uh, as when I was younger. There used to be more kind of healing services uh, we prayed for healing uh, at the last night of worship. It was really wonderful. People came down uh, to be prayed for. Um, but I have heard well-meaning preachers uh, or evangelists, seen lots of them, that have said, basically, if you're not healed, it's because you don't have enough faith. And, and that if I just have enough faith that I will be healed. And then they give me these scriptures that Jesus says about faith. And he, there are quite a few scriptures about faith. And that's all, all true, that, that we are to have faith. So basically what they're telling me is, it's up to me. So if I can just, and I've done this, if I can just concentrate enough, if I can just concentrate on enough faith uh, and make sure I'm not doubting, and if I can just do this, then I'll be healed. And, and this is kind of the message that was given to me. And I just need to tell you, that's not true. That's just not true. We need to have faith, but it's not if I can just do this mind over matter, uh, mental faith thing, then something will happen. 
That's just not true. Faith is not a weapon by which we demand things from God or we put him in subjection to us. It's not, oh, okay, I have all this faith and then God needs to do what I say. No, we're to have faith in God. Because faith is a recognition of one's inability to do anything and a confession that God can do everything. Are you with me? I know. This is... This is a a little bit challenging. You're probably thinking. You might have heard some different things. Faith derives its power not from the spiritual energy of the person who believes. Okay? It's not the human. It's not some type of spiritual energy that this person has. But it's from the supernatural power of the person who is believed in. God. It's him. It's all him. It's all him. It is not the act of faith. It is God in whom we have faith. Okay. And there's a difference. And remember what we have been consistently talking about is relationship. You're going to have greater faith in God, the better you get to know him. Through his word, through prayer, and through fellowship. Fellowship. Now, if you're a newer believer, when I'm talking about fellowship, that's a very spiritual sounding word, okay? Just talking about hanging out with believers in Christ. It's people that can encourage you, and you can encourage them. People that can challenge you, and you challenge them. And it's a, it's a two-way street, but it's a way we grow, and it's a way that we see God at work. And we, we see God at work in other people. And then they're encouraging us in God. This is fellowship. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And uh, it's part of that relationship with God. And also as a caveat, seeing God consistently work in your life over a period of time will also give you greater faith. You, you'll see him more and more in your life. All right. So how about... The big elephant in the room that, for me, I rarely hear this talked about. What happens when God doesn't heal? Because I'm just going to say that God obviously doesn't answer every prayer for healing. The ultimate reason is that he is God. And he knows best. He sees the whole parade, as it were. He distributes this gift of healing according to his will. It was in the scripture we read earlier. So if it's, now stay with me when I say this. If it's not his will, for whatever reason, we can trust that healing at that time will not achieve the best common good or the best declaration of his kingdom or the best thing for us personally, and therefore it's not best for us to receive at that moment. Now, that's a hard pill to swallow for someone facing constant pain, for someone facing a life-threatening diagnosis. I found a statement based on scripture that holds true. And this is from an article by a a gentleman named John Bloom. He's with Desiring God Ministries. And this just really grabbed me. God uses illnesses and afflictions in amazing, beautiful, and sanctifying ways to build our faith, cultivate our humility, experience his strong, sufficient grace, And this one I had to think about. And heighten our joy. I want to read a couple of scriptures. Psalm 119, 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Romans 5, 3 and 4. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, 
and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. I'm going to give three instances here. And the first one is my friend Scotty House. And I want to tell you, I could bring so many instances where we prayed for people. They never were healed, and they went to be with Jesus, like lots and lots. My friend Scotty House, and uh, he recently went to be with the Lord. And Scotty was in so much pain in his life. And every time I'd see him, we'd, I mean, we'd, we were always praying for him. Uh, and uh, he had some really neat things happen in his life, but he was always in constant pain. And that he was never healed of that. We prayed and prayed, and I, and I would ask the Lord, Lord, would you just help Scotty in his pain? He's, he, he can hardly walk, you know. And, uh, and those of you that were at his uh, memorial, you know, I was very emotional when I shared about Scotty. He meant a lot to me. And uh, I didn't understand everything that happened to him. Uh, but I do, you know, of course, when we go to be with Jesus, that is your healing. You are, obviously, if you, if you saw the other side, you'd be like, well, yeah, it's incredible. It's, he's doing incredible now. Well, I began to see, after Scotty passed away, mostly, I felt like the Lord really showed me some things. That this guy that was so rough and so um, much of his life did not live the way that he should. Much of his life. And he hurt his family, hurt a lot of people. But, but when he turned his life over to God and the progression, you could just almost see it. Uh, you could see it. Of God in his life, and as I was around him most weeks, because he would always uh, often come to our Thursday morning prayer, and I would see Scotty, and I would just go, wow, you know, God is using this guy like crazy. And here he's all broken down and in pain, and he, and he's, and he weeps and because he's in so much pain and, and uh, all these other things wrong with his body. But I saw God work through Scotty, and... Would he have, uh, have done it uh, the same way if Scotty would have been healed? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that his pain and his faith in God drove him to seek God more and more. And boy, could you see God in his life all the way up until he passed. Now, I'm going to mention another person, another friend of mine, and I've asked uh, Lynn, uh, DJ's wife, if it was okay. She said yes. DJ passed just, um, how long ago was that? Year? Year ago. All right, DJ, uh, I've been at this church for 20 years. DJ has been my friend uh, that whole time. I've known him since I first started coming. And uh, I'm just going to say this, like all of us, DJ had issues, okay? And I wasn't aware of everything, uh, but he did have some. He was always very nice, uh, very pleasant to be around, always a joker. Uh, I always liked him. Um, but he did have issues, again, like we all do. DJ got sick with cancer, and again, I saw such change in DJ. I saw him go from uh, a person who was always joking and, let's, I'll just be honest, pretty surfacy, okay? Pretty surfacy, but always nice. I saw him go from that to, boy, did he care. Boy, did he care about me. Boy, did he care about the people he was talking to. I, I could just stand there and watch him. It was amazing to me. And, and I had the opportunity, like, like several of you, to sit with DJ just days before he, he passed away. I just sat and listened to the guy. and what, I just wept. I went, he's about ready to meet Jesus. And man, has he changed. Wow. He cares so much about people. He cares so much about, about God. 
And I just didn't, I didn't see it to near that extent before. God chose not to heal DJ, except to give him that new life in heaven. I'm going to mention one more person. My brother-in-law, Rod Stutzman. Now, Rod is still with us. Rod, uh, Teresa's brother, is one of the funniest guys I know. He's always got a joke. He's a prankster. Uh, Rod was o- always pretty surfacy again. And uh, Rod, uh, again, I, I'm terrible with dates. Was it beginning of this year? Yeah, beginning of this year. Out of nowhere, Rod had kidney failure. Didn't see it coming. They didn't line them up. Rod suddenly almost lost his life because his kidneys, both kidneys, failed. And so to this day, since then, Rod has been on dialysis. Now, Rod is pretty young. What is he, early 50s, something like that? And he looks young. He's a big old guy. And, and uh, Rod's still a joker. Uh, <laughs> still a joker. But you want to talk about a changed guy. Confronted with the brevity of his life. Now he talks about God. Now he talks about people. Now he cries when he talks about his family. Uh, he cries when he talks about his friends. And, and I have seen uh, people that he's worked with changing their lives, changing how they're living because of what Rod is going through. Isn't that right, Teresa? It's having a huge effect. Is this easy? No, it's hard. It's really hard. But it's the beauty of God. It's the beauty of God, and oftentimes it comes through difficult things. If I could have the worship team come up, that'd be great. I want to talk about the Apostle Paul for a second. He dealt with some kind of ailment that was a source of pain and frustration to him. This was after he had had a divine revelation from heaven. So um, God had spoken to him incredibly. He had showed him all these things about heaven that most people don't know. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, stay with me, it's it's, uh, three verses. It says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations... A thorn was given, <coughs> excuse me, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am what? Then I am strong. Paul's thorn is among the most famous afflictions in history. And we don't even know what it was. There's been a lot of speculation over the years. I mean, it could have been a physical affliction. You hear different things. Uh, It could have been his eyes from Galatians 4. Um, Who knows? I mean, there was a lot of physical violence and and deprivation that he endured uh, as an evangelist at that time. You know, the book of Acts just says all these things that he went through and uh, was stoned and beaten and uh, over and over again at different times. Uh, who knows? It was a physical, it could have been a physical affliction. Uh, he, refor- he referred to his thorn as a harassing messenger of Satan. Could have been vulnerable to significant 
spiritual, psychological struggles, maybe. We don't know. Uh, you know, he used to violent, violently persecute Christians. You don't just wash that away from your memory. Uh, he moved on, obviously, when, once the Lord Jesus revealed himself to the Apostle Paul, and he gave his life to doing the opposite of that. Who knows? We don't know. It says he had anxiety for all the churches. Since we don't know the nature of his affliction or disability, and that, I believe, is on purpose. That, that's when God gives any thorn to us, any kind of affliction, whatever it might be, we can share his experience of divine grace. His power is made perfect in weakness. When we are weak, then we are strong. Why? Because we're depending on God to help us, not our own power. I've read this scripture so many times, and I've just wondered, because Paul, you know, his recognition of the fact that he's made strong when he's weak, he, he recognizes that, and he delights in it. He delights in it. He, it brings him joy. I've always wondered about that. Really? Really? It brings you joy? That's what it says. I, and I believe him. I believe that's true. Now, I've seen these, this scriptural truth played out in the three people I mentioned. And like I say, I could mention many more. I've known so many people that have been sick and were not healed and passed away. Many of them young. I have sat with, as a pastor, uh, goodness. Goodness, I had a young guy, a drummer, years ago, he got leukemia. I sat with his mother while they told him he had weeks to live. I'm sure many of you have, have been through that same thing with people. I don't understand why he wasn't healed. I do know this. His memorial service was one of the most powerful services I have ever been to. The Holy Spirit was just so thick. You could just, it was tangible. Powerful. Powerful. Is that easy? No. It's hard, especially for the person that's going through it. Do we pray for healing? Yes. Do we have faith for healing? Yes. Does God have compassion for my plight? Yes. Is God willing to heal? Yes. And when God heals, he has a greater purpose than just for the individual. When he does heal, we rejoice. We uplift the name of Jesus. We tell the world of his goodness. He loves you so very, very much. And if he heals you, it's because he loves you. But beyond that, he wants to reach the world. He wants to reach everyone with the gospel. So it's not just for us. It's for the gospel. But if he doesn't heal, that is not the end. It is only the beginning. And I know that's hard. But God will reveal himself. Do you continue to, to pray for healing? Yes. Do you believe that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him? Yes. It just isn't always the way we picture it and rarely is. I have found that to be true. But then I've seen him do incredible things that I never saw coming. When I am weak, then I am strong. 